Thank you. No, I was very sorry. I was on my plane and I was trying to remember this key to my restaurant and I was having a hard time. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to try. <laughs> <laughs> Try it on the road. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We'll probably see a couple other folks trickle in as they're coming back from lunch, but appreciate you all being here. I'm very excited to be moderating this panel with three very intelligent researchers. And what we're here to talk about today is the research that they are conducting related to really important topics that are emerging as topics like carbon accounting, grid flexibility, next generation procurement, all these areas of important ways that companies, end users can uh, prove and show that they wanna take actions that can help further and accelerate decarbonization. My name is Hallie Kramer. I work at Google as a technical program manager on data and software climate solutions. And at Google, we really appreciate the research in these areas to help inform our decision making as well. You may have heard of carbon accounting from other uh, topics and sessions today. And it's emerging as we see that the greenhouse gas protocol recently kicked off their multi-year revision process, become increasingly important in carbon disclosure requirements by governments across the world. And therefore, the time is ripe to improve the metrics and methodologies that we can use that can drive really meaningful change. 
So our objective today is to share findings from re these researchers and their most recent projects and uh, discover a bit more and dive into these areas. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, we have Anna Radovanovich. Anna has been a research scientist at Google since early 2008, after she earned her PhD in electrical engineering from Columbia University. For the last 10 years, Anna has focused her research efforts at Google on building innovative technologies and business models with two goals in mind. First, to deliver more reliable, affordable, and clean electricity to everyone in the world. And second, to help Google become a thought leader in decarbonizing the grid. Next, we have Galen Pease. Galen is a data scientist at Singularity Energy, where she works with complex data sets in production systems to enable grid decarbonization. Before joining Singularity, she earned a master's degree in earth sciences at Dartmouth College and holds a BS in computer science from MIT. And lastly, we have Igor Ripen, who uh, is a researcher and energy system modeler at the Technical University of Berlin in Germany. Igor completed a PhD in energy economics and master of science in power engineering at the Brandenburg University of Technology, Germany. His work focuses on developing and applying energy system models at the intersection of economics and applied optimization to guide public and private sector uh, stakeholders in dealing with challenges of the energy transition. With that, let's start high level and think about why is research important, both to you personally and generally, and if there are any personal anecdotes you'd like to share of how you got involved in research. Anna, we'll start with you. Hi everybody, it's a pleasure to be here today. So the reason why I started doing this is the fact that the electricity sector is the top driving, one of the top driving forces of increasing uh, emissions from greenhouse gas emissions, uh, among which is CO2, carbon dioxide emissions, one of the dominant gas uh, pollutant. Uh, it's been happening that actually the ch ch climate change is going on and we have been facing it for the last two, three decades and this was scientifically validated that it's not something that is just anymore a mystery. So, um, and what happened in the last two, three decades, we've seen uh, very new technologies that happen across the board. So we've seen a div huge development uh, like in uh, technologies that are covering physical layer, so photovoltaics, uh, uh, fast circuit breakers, um, uh, communication technologies. We've seen infrastructure being developed. We've seen developments in um, um, real-time algorithms, algori algorithmic te techniques used for balancing, uh, and also like in economic sector as well. So. There, is the, there seemed to be the right opportunity to focus and to combine all these new technologies in uh, solving the energy research problem. Uh, combining all of these and thinking about the problem of uh, development, uh, smart and intelligent load generation as well as infrastructure overall, all that is going to support reliability, efficiency and carbon awareness in the grid is something that can that definitely is the hypothesis can create a huge impact. Me personally, like I started with this probably you read about carbon aware computing at Google. Uh, the fact that computing has been growing, computing instances have been growing more than six times in the last 10 years. It's a huge thing. So like, and all the computing, the power demand from the computing today is of the order of magnitude of 1% of electricity, of total electricity consumption in the world. So it's huge. And our hypothesis is that if we harness the flexibility of computing inappropriately, we can be supporting the grid and contributing a lot of, to its reliability and carbon awareness as well. So. You know you're speaking to a researcher who starts with our hypothesis of research in general. Great, thanks, Anna. Uh, Galen, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think uh, you know at the heart of it, I am personally also motivated by climate change, um, and Singularity Energy as an organization also is um, our our goal as an organization uh, is to help people further decarbonization efforts. Um, and I think our, our motivation to doing basic research is uh, 
we know that the carbon intensity of electricity is highly variable in time and space, and that's only increasing as more green energy comes onto the grid. Uh, and we believe that research that gives us a better handle on that variability can help people make better decisions. Um, and so the research I'll be discussing today furthers that goal. Great. And Igor, anything you'd like to add? Yes, just uh, hi, everyone. Happy to be here. Uh, to answer why research is important, I would connect points raised by Anna and Galen and also the keynote uh, points today. Uh, so the challenges that we are uh, facing now is the need to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions from every sector of economy and actually the need to do it very, very fast. Drives and requires a process we broadly call the energy transition, which involves changing all of the aspects of energy generation, use, uh, planning of storage, rewiring, rebuilding, and building mobile energy networks, and many, many more other things. So when we think about the future energy systems, we typically imagine them clean. So all of the talks all around is about net zero or net clean or clean energy. We also imagine the energy system to be affordable, and we also imagine them to be safe and secure. So the energy research, or better to phrase, the continuous and joint effort from the research community, which is here, and also the policy people and people from um, NGOs and so further. So the joint continuous effort is just our way to get there to the future that we imagine in, the future, uh, imagine in front of ourselves. And also the research ensures that on our way from here to there, we do inform decisions. Thank you. Now we're going to get to the exciting part, talking about the new research. So I'd love to go down the line and understand a bit more about what was your primary research question in your most recent research uh, related to decarbonization, and are there any key takeaways you'd like to highlight for this crowd or any challenges, anything unexpected that came up along the way? So, Igor, let's start with you. All right, then Argentina. Um, in our group, and TU Berlin and Google team is currently collaborating on research projects that is dealing with 24-7 clean energy procurement. So in this project, in a nutshell, what we are doing is we run computer models for the entire NCO area, and we simulate the dispatch of all energy assets and the long-term development of the whole European electricity system. While doing so, we uh, encode and run scenarios that mimic that some commercial and industry consumers commit to clean energy procurement goals. Last year, in October, we released the first report from this collaboration where among other we ask questions, how can companies in European context achieve 24-7, what is required for that, what is the markup premium, and how does it affect the entire energy system? This year we continue the collaboration and we plan to release a new study uh, in June, so end of this month, where we narrow our focus down to data centers and their flexibility. So data centers are quite special uh, electricity consumers, they have a set of unique characteristics. So one of them is that um, there are some com flexible computing jobs and associated computing loads which are shiftable. And they can be shiftable in time, so it means delay to later point of time, or they can be shifted in space. So if you look at this problem like I do from the classes of energy system modeler, you can immediately guess the sense where it becomes exciting because you think about optimization problem about some relatively large consumers located in various places of the grid that can co-optimize space and time flexibility. And even more exciting than that, because of clean energy procurement goals, the jobs can be shifted to place and times of where grid uh, emission intensity is lower. So uh, in our report, we analyze and model the things thoroughly and the main takeaway we show that the space and time flexibility drives economically efficient rate dispatch of data center loads and it unlocks some system level benefits like reduction of renewable curtailment. We also show that um, space time uh, flexibility allows you to achieve very clean uh, emission, very clean consumption portfolio with much lower resources than you would need otherwise. And this hopefully can um, push uh, more data center operators to commit to 24-7 movement. And we also highlight in the report various mechanisms how uh, flexibility enables simply achieving clean energy goals. Also for those uh, participants joining 24-7 efforts who do not have any flexibility. 
So this is a major takeaways from the study. And one uh, last note from my side for, um, uh, for energy modeling community who is here. So all of the uh, work which we are doing with Google is done in open source. So this means complete scientific workflow behind those studies. So from data scraping, data preparation, modeling, plotting, even compilation of reports is available on GitHub. And uh, supposedly, I, at least I plan to design it, that it's run, it can, it's replicable on your local machines with simple terminal snake mail commands. So you can play with it, break it, build on top, and uh, check it out if uh, it sounds interesting for you. Great. Thank you, Igor. And Galen, on to you and your research. Yeah, so uh, in the spirit of building on to you Berlin's work, we have been actually using uh, the same PIPSA Europe model, um, along with a uh, similar model from a different group of the Eastern Interconnect in the US. But instead of exploring how these grids are going to develop uh, over time, we're instead looking at the physics of their current behavior. So the question that we wanted to answer was, um, if you are a data center, for example, or if you have some other load and you are interested in buying a PPA or a REC uh, to offset some of your energy consumption, um, and you, as a, as a criteria, you want some of that energy to be physically delivered to your load. Uh, what does that actually mean um, on today's grid? And so to answer that question, we did power flow tracing on this model of the transmission system. So we traced the generation from every generator in the system to every load in the system. Um, and then once you have that data, you can ask questions like, uh, what is the typical distance that power travels from a generator? Uh, how does that vary over space and time? Um, how does that vary from region to region within a grid or between the European grid and the American grid? Uh, and then the, the final piece of our research was we wanted our insights to be applicable to the GHG protocol revision process that's going on right now. So we wanted to think about how this data could be integrated into some kind of framework that people could follow. Um, and to integrate into a framework, it's, it's difficult to think about it, every specific place that a load could be on the grid, and you instead want some way to summarize this physical delivery behavior um, at some kind of regional level. So uh, we came up with a set of metrics that summarize uh, within a region how physically deliverable electricity is if you are a load located in that region and you're procuring generators within that region. Um, and I would say that our, our top level result is that most electricity is consumed pretty close to where it was generated. We're talking within like 100 kilometers. Um, but some electricity at some times of the year can travel much further. Uh, and then there are some specific places on the grid in Norway and Sweden, for example, where electricity is kind of exported towards the mainland and can travel much further. Um, so going back to our Singularity Energy's overall research uh, objectives, we did find that you know this data is variable in time and space, um, and there are really interesting patterns to be found there. Thank you, Galen. Anna. Thank you. Uh, so it's very interesting, like, and there is this third line of research, I think, that complements the two that uh, Igor and Galen uh, mentioned today. And this is the question, like, what do we do with load shaping? How do we affect the grid? I mean, we can be talking, we can probably, uh, based on GAG protocols and accounting mechanism, we can be doing good for uh, well for Google, but how do we contribute? What is the impact on grid level emissions? <laughs> and this is something that we wanted to do since we started this carbon aware computing movement, and this type of study requires really granular simulation work. So you cannot just, you have to recreate the real time operations of a balancing authority. So. That is why it's very hard. People discuss the problems with data and data access. Here, this is like knowing exactly how the market delivery and what about how the market operates. So we luckily 
created a consortium with the electric power engineers. This is the company that closely work with, works with ERCOT. This is the operator in Texas. This is un the only unregulated market in the United States. And a University of Florida, Sean Mine, he's a, he, he's a control theory person who worked in the domain of energy for more than, I think, 15, 20 years now. So what we've done, uh, we discovered, we wanted to, to actually say, okay, we shape load. Currently, like in, first we started with temporal shifting only, and our next phase hopefully will be impact of spatial shifting as well. And we say, okay, if computing, like a Google data center does it in one node, how it's going to affect, like with the current operations, because currently op operators do not do carbon aware, <laughs> like matching, they do economic dispatch. So what, what does it, is it going to reduce the emission? And what should be the shaping policy that is going to uh, lead to uh, emissions reduction? And really the surprising fact is that some policies that are actually recommended and discussed even in the open source communities are not the one that necessarily reduce emissions. Uh, and I'm talking about annual CO2, like uh, actually when I count emissions, I count the emissions that are actually obtained by summing all the direct emissions from the dispatch generation. Uh, so we studied the impact on different policies and we actually showed that we can even come up with the better algorithms that the commonly, um, commonly referred heuristics, right, that are currently proposed. Uh, obviously, we showed also that if someone and we, we, we were able to change the policy and operators be able to, to incorporate load flexibility into their operations that we could achieve much more. And this is order of magnitude more. So definitely like, so if we wanted to contribute to decarbonization, we have to do like, or try to influence. Uh, more. So I'm talking about computing, but all this research is irrespective of computing. So you can apply it to uh, like any flexible load, right, uh, on the electricity grid. Uh, another thing is just I want to finish that uh, these impacts and what we got from these studies actually real. We asked, we asked, oh, is uh, go one Google data center with its typical size and load flexibility able to do something meaningful on one grid like Texas grid? And the answer is yes. Okay, thank you. Great, and we're just really scratching the surface here. There's a lot more to dig into, but we have limited time. Galen, I'll go, I'll go to you on this one. Listening to your fellow researchers, what stands out most from, from what you're hearing here? Yeah, I think the the most exciting direction that I see going forward for kind of synergy between our different research efforts um, is with some of this uh, impact exploration. So everything we've done has been just looking at the physics of the grid as it is today. But obviously we're interested in changing that grid into the future. And so I think the kinds of questions that Igor's modeling can tackle about actually once you say, for example, you uh, integrate some kind of um, location requirement into uh, market-based accounting. So you ask people to procure clean energy from the same region that they're located in uh, or from regions close to where they're located in. What does that actually mean for how the grid evolves over time? Um, and does that actually result in better outcomes or not? Because as Anna mentioned, there can be kind of uh, counterintuitive effects even of some of, the, some of the policies that are commonly advocated for. So I think the research on the current state of the grid is an important baseline, um, but because we're interested in changing that grid, you also need to you need to actually model that um, and see, see what could happen. Thank you. Igor, I'm gonna go to you for this one. You mentioned in your opening the, the open source community that LFE has here. How could an open source community like LFE support the needs that this research uh, identifies? Yeah, sure, gladly. Uh, very, very happy to be uh, here to talk to LFE community. 
So first, uh, just a quick mention on open source research on top of what we have heard on keynote talks. What we heard that we know and we all agree to that the open source research increases the transparency and credibility and reduces wasteful duplication of work. We also heard that open source research increases collaboration. All of this is true. One thing which sometimes is behind the curtain, but which is also true, that it's actually only through open source research. We researchers can uh, rely on the shoulder of each other and finally start answering questions instead of always, ever and ever, over and over, develop the same tools in different places at the same time. So this is super important. So I think the first thing which uh, the community can do is, of course, we should facilitate and uh, improve and in increase our community uh, of open source research, showing good example. Uh, we should also not forget about good open source practices because just taking your sandbox model, make a zip file and put into the node is not really open source research, right? We all agree to this. Um, secondly, if uh, some of the community would like to do the research in the energy field and just want to start from the advanced spaces, you might know that our research group develops the open source ecosystem of model and energy systems. You can check it out on pipes.org. It's the models, the data packages, and all of you need to out of the box start modern energy systems. And thirdly, if somebody would be interested to uh, build on top or, or contribute or collaborate on this particular research which I presented on 24-7 or data center flexibility, you can check it out on GitHub, fork it, play it, break it, and uh, let me know if, uh, if you have uh, questions or more ideas. Great. Anna, I'm curious, based on the, the findings from your research, is there any advice that you have for the audience here today on, on how they can help? Yes, I think that energy domain knowledge and the effect that actions taken in the space of like what you do to the load or what you do, tools that you use, even if they are open source, matter a lot. So understanding, having validated algorithms, data, and methods that are scalable and validated, I mean, they're, they're very important. Uh, what we've seen are counterintuitive, uh, counterintuitive results sometimes. We also, when we studied these grid problems, we understood that actually, like even the grid is not some, even today or tomorrow, they don't have to be the same because the operator might be adding some transmission lines for reliability reasons. So we have to be, you can get count, sort of counter intuitive results even though this is a reality. So uh, energy domain connected, you know, it's, it's uh, knowledge is uh, extremely important. Um, uh, also, I think that uh, another thing that I would add and advise is probably that uh, is incorporating what I think it's what Igor actually alluded to. It's incorporating uh, the research findings into development of tools. Uh, that we could, f for example, for sharing what we discussed today, for sharing validated data, <coughs> validated signals for carbon aware, if we, if we are, want to do it, because only if we are doing it uh, in a re like provably uh, a proper manner, right, directionally correct manner, we can be actually addressing the problem of climate change. And we are coming up on time, so I'd love to ask one more question for all of you, which is the big question of what's next. How might this research evolve in the future, or what are other considerations as you're thinking about what's next on the research frontier? Start with Igor. Um, well, um, the study which I, we released in October uh, asks the general questions on how companies can achieve 24-7 procurement in Europe. And the study which we released in June uh, asks a question of space-time flexibility, how can it help, and which impact it has on the system. So these are just two specifically designed studies around topic 24-7, and of course the scope of research was limited just to the questions which I aim to answer, and there is a plenty of things one could discover. So with the team, among other, we talked about um, incorporate uh, weather year realization, which is a big thing uh, for renewable-based uh, systems. We also plan to model uh, the electricity systems in very refined resolution. So this will go in direction what Highland is doing. Um, but among other things, uh, we look forward for more ideas, and if 
any of you have a good idea on what must be next, please let me know over the coffee. I definitely I think about this. Great, Galen, go ahead. Yeah, so as I already mentioned, there's definitely a potential to explore what uh, market designs based on some kind of location constraint would mean for the evolution of the grid. Um, one different direction that I think is really exciting is using power flow tracing not just to trace delivery from generators, but actually to trace the uh, resource mix and the emissions intensity uh, of electricity from the generators, which are obviously the emission source, to the consumers who are arguably responsible for the emissions used to generate the electricity they're consuming. Um, and that's exciting to me because uh, it opens the potential for um, more, more granular understanding of actually what the emissions are uh, at every place where electricity is being consumed um, and potentially uh, more informed decision making. Thank you. Anna. So for us, because we don't want to be just using one study to make general conclusions, obviously. So we would like to see how the methodologies and results that we got scale across different grids. How would this anything change if we ran a similar study in a different reality, like in five to 10 years when you have a different assemble of different assets, you know? And so now would the results persist and would the policy uh, influence the decarbonization in the same way. So this is from the point of view th this research. Uh, I hope that also like uh, when we run these policies and suggest ideas, it's actually mainly uh, focused and our, our vision is to influence the development of softwares and tools. So it's really like if we suggest policies and algorithms and the grid level signals to follow to, to contribute to decarbonization, that is something that would be actually really directed to the open source communities to, to, to implement for different products that deal, that can affect software developers and consumers across the grid. Thank you, and I, I know we are at time, so I'll say to close us out, each of these studies is incredibly interesting and we encourage you all to, to dig in with the one caveat that they're not out yet. <laughs> so they will be coming out in the, the near future and so we are happy to, if you want to connect with us, we can share those with you when they do come out. And one of my lessons learned taking part in some way on, on each of these projects is that research is very purely iterative in its natural form and so you can't always anticipate the timeline or the findings and so sometimes it can take a little bit longer than you initially think. Uh, so really excited about this and as was mentioned, how it can inform tooling, how it can inform the policies and other standards going forward. Thank you to the panelists, thank you to LFE and we might have a minute for one or two questions but I will close us out there. Are there any questions? <laughs> okay. Nikki. Anyone want to take it? Um, I can also try. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll say personally, I think that there is an opportunity to, and, and this was actually, as um, you know, part of the, the initial motivation of the carbon data specification, which was presented earlier today, is how do we create this common language? And 
it, it makes me realize that maybe we can use this as an exercise, taking some of the more recent research that's out there and doing a comparison of what are the terms that were used and, and how were they used and defined and use that as a starting point as potentially a, a new uh, work item under our carbon data specification group. So it's a good question. Thank you. I, Chris. Yeah, I just wanted to add maybe we could have, we had some internal discussion on this. Uh, maybe we could have, I think, more often uh, like education sessions uh, yeah. uh, where we talk and create forums where we just establish this language, not keep them separate <laughs> across different communities beca because this is creating this polarization, I think. Okay, we are told to stop, but if you have any questions, please feel free to come up to us afterwards. Thank you all very much. Thank you.